our next speaker uh, I once referred to as the Oscar Wilde of the internet. He is the uh, most quotable man I know uh, talking about technology. Uh, Clay Shirky, uh, author of Here Comes Everybody, and uh, the guy who, more than anyone else, in my opinion, makes us think about uh, technology. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I want to quickly contrast two examples of applications that set out to harness large-scale contributions and participatory zeal on the part of the users. Uh, the first is not going to need any introduction at this conference, uh, Apps for Democracy, uh, Vivek Kundra's experiment last year in opening up a bunch of data sets in Washington, D.C., and saying essentially, come surprise us, come build applications that build on top of these data sets. They got four dozen applications in 30 days. They calculated an insane ROI of 4,000% on the effort. Uh, it, was, it was a remarkable success, and I think one of the high water marks that, that this conference is designed to highlight. Uh, but of course, attempts to harness uh, collaborative participation by the users, it's not, uh, it's not solely a government effort. Obviously, it goes on in managed organizations all over. In 2005, right, in the context of a newspaper, a similar experiment went on. Los Angeles Times, uh, the data set under their control was their editorial page. And in October of that year, they took an editorial about the Iraq War, they wiki-enabled it, and then they issued a bunch of press releases about this wiki-torial. Uh, and they invited their users to come in to participate, and they said essentially, rewrite this editorial in the manner of Wikipedia, make it better. And from the minute they launched it, right, the, the, the action on the site was almost immediate. Uh, first there was arguments, and then there was flame wars, then spam, then porn, then goat say images. Uh, if you've never seen a goat say image, now is not the time to start. Never is the time to start. Uh, and less than 20, less than 48 hours after the experiment launched, they pulled the plug. At around 5 a.m. on a Sunday morning, they said, "Kill it, kill the server. The experiment is over." Uh, it was a rapid, public, catastrophic humiliation. Rut row. So, what went wrong? What went wrong with Wikitorial? And in particular, what's the difference between something like Wikitorial, which very quickly imploded, and something like Apps for Democracy, which is a really remarkable success as a platform? It doesn't have anything to do with the technology. Hold that thought. So in January of 2000, beginning of this decade, a funny paper appeared in the Journal of Legal Studies. And it was funny because in a law journal, it was written in plain English, it was short, it was about psychology, and it didn't concern arcane aspects of the law. It, in, it concerned an experiment that the researchers had done at some daycare centers. The researchers, Yuri Gysi and Alfredo Rusticini, had gone and observed 10 daycare centers in Haifa. And they observed those daycare centers around pickup time. Right, the constant source of tension between the teachers and the parents. And the pickup time at these daycare centers was at 4 p.m. And after observing these 10 daycare centers, Gizzi and Rusticini saw that about seven times a week a parent would show up late to pick up their kids out of a population of about 35 or 40 kids. So they set out to change this. And they instituted a fine. And the title of their paper is A Fine is a Price. And the fine was quite simple. Right? You showed up after 4.10 in the afternoon, boom, you owed them 10 shekels, that was it, no ifs, ands, or buts. And in the six daycare centers where they implemented that fine, the change was immediate. Right? In the week after the fine was implemented, the number of parents picking up their kids late rose. And then it rose again the following week, and again the following week, and again the week after that, until four weeks after the fine had been implemented the number of parents picking up their kids late had tripled from seven a week to 20 a week. So they left that fine in place for 12 weeks, and the, the number of parents picking up late, about 20 a week, down here in the control group of the four schools they hadn't changed, stayed at seven a week the whole time. And then after a dozen weeks, they canceled the fine, and nothing changed. Parents still kept picking up their kids late at a rate of about 20 a week. So why, when a fine was implemented on behalf of the teachers, did it make the teacher's life worse? And the answer is, the fine killed the previous social agreement that had been in place. Right? 
Gysi and Rustichini's description of this is that previously the daycare center had been operating under something called an incomplete contract, which is to say, pickup time is four o'clock, you shouldn't pick your kids up late, but we're not really gonna say what bad thing happens if you do. And in the absence of clarity, the teachers and the students had come to a tacit social agreement. Right? And what Gysi and Rustichini had done by adding a fine is they'd added managerial oversight and market signaling. And management and the incentives of the market aren't something you can just trivially add to social relationships. Because the addition of those things transforms social relationships, and often not in a good way. If you have a nice date, it's okay to send flowers the next day. It's not okay to send the amount of money the flowers would have cost. <laughs> so, back to Wikitorial, right? This was the LA Times' first mistake. Their contract with the readers was too complete. They didn't say, here's all our data, surprise us. They didn't say even, here's all our editorial surprises. They didn't even say, here's today's editorial about the Iraq war, surprise us, annotate it or cross-link it or fact-check it or whatever. They said, here's today's editorial about the Iraq war. Please come in and rewrite it in the manner of Wikipedia. Right? That change had the following knock-on effect which is that the only people on the Wikitorial doing authentic, creative work were the people posting Goatse images, right? Because they were the only ones doing anything surprising, right? <laughs> Since the Times had already announced what they expected the readers to do, they had managed to wring out all the possible creative surprises, but not all the possible destructive surprises. And so the people there to, create, to, to make the destructive surprises were the people who were actually experimenting with what the system allowed. Right? And the Times might have been able to pull out from that problem, but for the fact that they had issued press releases far and wide saying in advance how great it was that the LA Times was getting jiggy with wikis. Right? And so they had no space to learn, go back, retool, and iterate. They had gone out so far in public with something whose workings they didn't yet understand that they had no space to adapt. Right? These are all things that Apps for Democracy did well. Apps for Democracy said, here's our data set, surprise us. Apps for Democracy understood, right? when Vivek Kundra designed the project, launched the project, right? understood that the motivations of the hacker participants were gonna be the thing that drove it forward and they did everything they could to both encourage and support those motivations. And they didn't take credit for the applications that launched until after they saw what they were. Now, there are a lot of differences between Apps for Democracy and Wikitorial. And of course, there's a lot of moving parts with any given piece of social software. But those three, I think, those three are critical. First of all, the contract with the users has to be complete enough to get them interested, but not so complete that it depresses them. Second of all, you have to understand that the users who are coming in are motivated to do things that you did not predict. And the more you try to predict, the more those motivations will go towards the destructive. They'll, so you have to give them space to participate. Otherwise, they feel like they're just minimum wage employees without even getting minimum wage. And third, right, in the domain of collaborative production, it is Heisenberg's press release. The more completely in advance you take credit for future success, the less likely that success becomes. Now, if I asked you to make a list of three characteristics that would flummox a bureaucracy, would your list look much different than that? That's why this stuff is hard. Right? It's not hard because of the technology. It's hard organization. There's no more robust observation in the 40-year history of writing about social software than that the users never do exactly what the designers either want or expect. Right? And that's not if the application is failing, that's if it's a success. Right? Failure is nobody uses it at all. Successful applications create surprises. And if you want to take advantage of the collaborative and participatory zeal of the users, you're not doing it despite the possibility of surprises. You're doing it because of the possibility of surprises. And the key right, is to make an incomplete contract of the sort that invites the user in and lets them know that you understand that they want to and you want to help them 
make those surprises as creative as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you.